how do we choose a meal in the restaurant? Especially in Chinese restaurant, it might be a nightmare. We look at all the possible choices. Usually we ask our friends, what are you choosing? Maybe we will ask a waiter, what do you recommend? But quite often we don't trust him or her, thinking they want, they want us to buy the most expensive dish or something no one else wants to eat. You know, sometimes actually we prefer to go in restaurants where there is no choice. The most expensive restaurants are those where the chef decides. Now in London, a few years ago, they opened a restaurant which only served one dish. The lines in front of this restaurant were enormous. I, when I go to a Chinese restaurant, I always choose the same, thinking, you know, I don't want to be bothered by too much choice. Choice is very anxiety provoking. Famous Danish philosopher uh, Kierkegaard already knew that hundreds of years ago when he wrote in a book on anxiety that anxiety is always linked to freedom. He said that anxiety is so horrifying because it's kind of leading to the possibility of possibility. Now, after another famous philosopher, Jean-Paul Sartre, also dealt with the question of choice and anxiety, in one of his texts he mentions that when a man is standing in front of the abyss, he is not afraid that he will fall, but actually he is anxious that he has a power to throw himself into the abyss. Now, Albert Camus also dealt with a similar question. He said that many mornings he's thinking whether he should have another cup of coffee or whether he should kill himself. <laughs> now, choice and anxiety are linked to loss. Now, Sigmund Freud pointed out that behind every anxiety, actually, there is the anxiety of the loss of our own life. Now, choice as such is linked to the loss in this way that when we choose one direction in life, we lose the possibility of choosing another. And because when we are making choices, we often don't want to deal with this loss, nowadays, a lot of people cannot make any decision. Psychoanalysts are observing that people are becoming incredibly anxious in today's times dominated by choice. Now, Sigmund Freud already dealt with this issue. Once a friend came to me and he said, to, you know, should I marry this particular woman? Freud said, you know, when it comes to small things in life, you should think long and hard. But when it comes to big things, like to marry or not, to have children or not, which profession you choose, you just do it. <laughs> now, of course, Freud didn't think, you know, in such a way that actually we can make kind of rational choices. Freud sort of knew that when we are making choices, our unconscious is very much at work. When people are making choices, very often they are not rational choices. They are thinking what other people are choosing. They are thinking what is society acceptable choice. And in many ways, they are unconsciously driven to make one choice or another. And because they are afraid of a loss, and because nowadays they feel that they are responsible for everything in their lives, anxiety increases. In today's time, Choice is not simply perceived as a matter of consumption. Yes, we are choosing consumer objects, but more and more we are under impression that we can choose our own life, that we can choose the direction in which it will go, that we can choose our body, you know, our sort of happiness, emotions, love is supposed to be a matter of choice. Even anger is supposed to be a matter of choice, how our children will turn out. We're supposed to be responsible and can make choices. So this illusion that we are masters in our life has created a lot of anxiety in people's life. 
Jacques Lacan, French psychoanalyst in the 70s, gave a lecture in Milan where he pointed out that capitalism is a system that kind of speeds up. It works quicker and quicker. We produce more and more. We produce quicker and quicker. We consume more and more. And we are suddenly under the impression that we are not anymore proletarian slaves, but we are actually masters of our lives. We can sort of choose the direction of our lives. We are sort of self-makers of our lives. Now, Lacan observed already then that capitalism creates new types of sufferings, new types of symptoms that are linked to the speed of the system and this call to the subject to perceive him or herself as a master. The new symptoms are anxiety, depression, various forms of addictions, various forms of self-consumption, self-cutting, anorexia, bulimia, all these symptoms are on the rise. My friend from Japan, Daisuke Fukuda, recently told me that he has, as a psychoanalyst in his practice, a lot of women who actually have a problem observing themselves in the mirror. In Japan, there is a huge propaganda now that one can choose how one is looking. There are many, many leaflets around for discount on plastic surgery. You know, you get three for the price of one, or you get a discount for the second one, and so on. So a lot of people internalize that there is the choice of what kind of a face they can have. As a result, a symptom emerged where people cannot observe themselves in the mirror. One particular patient of the suke is breaking every mirror she comes across. She removed all mirrors in her house and cannot observe her reflection in any window because she's under the impression that she has not done the right thing in the direction of how she wants to look. Of course, we know in psychoanalysis that ideology does not directly influence people's symptoms. People in some way are also making choices of their suffering. Again, not rational choice. Freud introduced a peculiar term, nervosenwahl. Now, he didn't think that people actually sit down and decide, okay, now I want to have this kind of a nervo nervosis, or I want to be a psychotic. Rather, he didn't want to perceive the subject as being a tool in the hands of external mechanisms, like society, family, or even biology itself. For it perceived the subject as an author of his or her suffering. However, he used the term choice because he wanted to point out that the subject actually has a possibility of change. Choice is incredibly important to think also democratic process. Elections, you know, political choices are linked to the idea of freedom and the possibility of making decision. What has happened today, however, is that choice has been glorified as an ideology which is actually pacifying people to make social choices. When choice is perceived mostly as something that individuals do in regard to their life, in the regard to the direction of their life, we are often forgetting about social choices. We are forgetting about the fact that choice can be something that we make collectively. And we also are forgetting the fact that we can actually make social changes. Now, when we are speaking that choice is anxiety provoking, we should not forget that people get pacified precisely because they endlessly feel guilty that they have not done the right choice. Many people who make long choices about what kind of consumer objects they will buy, when they buy that object, try to exchange it. Or I recently read that a lot of people who read online forums about which car to buy or buying by journals, you know, about various cars actually have already bought the car. After people buy the car, they want to convince themselves that the choice was the right one, which is why they continue sort of reading these newspapers. Now, in the domain of love, people have incredible anxiety nowadays whom to choose. And it appears that with the new 
technology like Tinder, people are actually not making any choice at all. They're te choosing temporarily, but no one for the long term. So in some way, kind of the continuation of the ideology of choice is a becoming a kind of a non-choice movement. A moment where people are procrastinating endlessly, are never making a decision in regard to the partner, are constantly changing their jobs, constantly changing the consumer objects, like we can endlessly change our mobile phone providers, and that can you know, fill up our days with endless research. Now, when we are doing this, of course, we always feel that there is something behind the corner, something better, another better person, or so on. Now, the solution in regard to this tyranny of choice is that people, in some way, should not take choice so seriously. We will always have to deal with loss. We will always have to deal with failure and dissatisfaction with the choices that we made. Capitalism actually thrives on dissatisfaction. You know, if we are not dissatisfied, we would not be you know, consuming more. Some years ago, a book has been published about the idea of happiness. In this book, the idea was that actually in the future, we will have a society that will be totally happy. Now, this happens when people started reading a particular self-help book where, you know, when they finished reading the book, they abandoned their subscription to fitness clubs, they stopped going, to, you know, for plastic surgeries, they stopped buying clothes, and sooner or later they have put on the uh, doors of their offices the sign, gone fishing. Now, capitalists were horrified, you know, Colla businesses started collapsing one after another, which is why, you know, the capitalists got together and decided we have to convince the person who wrote this book to write a sequel, How to be Miserable. Otherwise, our profits will go down. Now, when they finally met this person, the author of the book, which was actually a kind of a collage of all the existing self-help books, you know, they did succeed at the end to convince him to write a sequel and capitalism thrived again. Now, if capitalism actually needs people to feel dissatisfied, it, today the post-industrial capitalism actually also needs people to fully identify with the idea that they are masters of their lives, that everyone can make it, and that happiness is just around the corner. However, psychoanalysts observe a lot of symptoms coming out of the happiness industry too. Susie Orbach, British psychoanalyst, recently shared with, her, with me a story of one of her patients who had done all the right choices in her life. She, when she came to the first session, she kind of came with the list of the right choices. She went to the right school, is working in the right profession, earns a lot, bought her own apartment, found a boyfriend, and then she calculated all this and she said, and where is happiness? Why am I not satisfied? Now, Susie realized that all the choices the woman was making were sort of so socially desirable choices. It was the choices that she thought were something that will bring her to happiness. I think that happiness ideology has created vast amount of misery in our lives. We can only temporarily have the moment of happiness, but mostly it is misery which is driving us to do something in life, to create, you know, to compose, to make a picture, to give a talk or whatever. We have to be frustrated enough to sort of move out of our bed. Now, if this ideology of choice has made people passive, anxious, constantly feeling guilty of their about what is happening in their life, one way to deal with it is to stop thinking about choice only as an individual matter. In the 50s, Steve Allen, American comedian, created a show, The Question Man. His idea was that we live in society with far too many answers, which is why it is necessary to pose more questions. And I think that precisely 
in today's times, it is necessary to revision the question, what choice is really about? What is the social choice we should be engaged? And also, why is loss and failure, which is necessarily linked to choice, still so anxiety-provoking? Thank you.